Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. We've spent a while talking about territoriality at the state or national scale, but now we're going to be looking internally within states at various subnational scales. So tonight we're going to examine electoral geography or how geography can impact elections. So let's talk about the United States electoral system. We have a two house legislative branch at the national level, consisting of the Senate and the House of Representatives. In the Senate, each state gets two senators, regardless of their population size. But the House of Representatives is based on population. So the bigger, more populous states have more representatives and the smaller, less populous states have fewer. These representatives are elected to districts that have similar sized populations. But people move and populations change. So how does the House of Representatives take that into account? Well, every 10 years, we have a census, which counts the population of every state throughout the whole country. Then we can compare which states grew in population and which states shrank. Then we undergo a process called reapportionment. There are 435 seats in the House of Representatives, and through reapportionment, those seats are reallocated to the states based on population change. This ensures that each state's population is accurately represented in the House of Representatives. So most states keep the same number of representatives after the census, but some gain and some lose seats as well. For example, our states in purple like California, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New York all lost seats after the 2020 census. But Oregon, Montana, Colorado, Florida, and North Carolina all gained one seat, and Texas gained two seats. Nevada, while gaining population, didn't gain any additional seats in the House of Representatives this census, though we did after the 2000 and 2010 censuses. So after reapportionment, or the reallocation of house seats, each state goes through the process of redistricting. Redistricting means that the voting districts are redrawn to accurately reflect the new census data. This means that districts are redrawn every 10 years. Redistricting takes place at the subnational level, with individual states responsible for drawing their own electoral district lines. And here's where scale is important. These representatives will represent a more local community, only a section of a state, but they vote on policies at the national scale. And when states gain or lose representation, that affects the state as a whole. So scale is really important for understanding electoral geography. Even though Nevada's representation didn't change the reapportionment or the reallocation of representatives, the population has changed. So the redrawing of district lines, known as redistricting, still has to happen. So let's take a look at our four new congressional districts. Notice District 1 is very tiny, while Districts 2 and 4 are very large. This showcases the impact of density and concentration. Urban areas have a lot of people very close together, while rural areas, density and concentration are quite low. And this can be a challenge for elected officials. Do you think people living in urban Spring Valley have the same concerns as people living in Anthem? How about the concerns out in Blue Diamond? What about Little Searchlight? All those different communities are represented in Congressional District 3. P3 
people living in rural areas have different concerns and maybe even different values than people living in large urban or suburban areas. And sometimes a single representative may have to speak on all of their behalves. And while we've been focusing primarily on the House of Representatives on this slide, it's important to note that there are voting districts for smaller areas too. The Nevada State Senate and Assembly, Clark County Commission, Henderson City Council, and the Clark County School District Board of Trustees. Each of these districts is subject to occasional redistricting. And it's worth remembering that as well. When it comes to redistricting, equal representation is the most important. So each district must have approximately the same population. Other general rules apply because the districts need to be compact, meaning fairly close together, and contiguous or all in one piece. But since each individual state gets to decide how to redraw, State officials can manipulate boundaries to favor a political party, ethnic group, or religion. This is known as gerrymandering, or redistricting for advantage, or the practice of dividing areas into electoral districts to give one political party an electoral majority in a large number of districts, while concentrating the voting strength of the opposition in as few districts as possible. This bizarre term comes from the governor of Massachusetts, Elbridge Gary, who in 1812 drew congressional districts in Massachusetts to benefit his political party. One district looked so odd that it was the subject of a political cartoon where it was called a Gary Mander, which we then proceeded to mispronounce to the point that it's now called gerrymander. So strange shapes have come to define gerrymandering. And when we look at the most gerrymandered district in the United States, it makes sense. This is North Carolina's 12th congressional district, which following the 2010 census was the most gerrymandered district in the United States for that decade. In fact, North Carolina had three out of the 10 most gerrymandered districts after the 2010 census. And while gerrymandering of congressional districts typically receives the most attention, it should be noted that it extends down to the local scale as well, influencing city council and school board districts, which may actually have a greater impact on individual people's day-to-day -day lives. So how do politicians gerrymander? Well, there are several ways to redraw a district to give one group an advantage. Packing is when one party is concentrated into just a single district, creating an unnecessarily large majority, well above what is needed to win an election. This ensures that that party can't win in the surrounding districts. Cracking is when the opposition party is divided up across many districts, diluting their numbers so they don't form a majority in any of the districts. In both strategy, votes are wasted, either because there are way more than are needed to win, as with packing, or not enough to ever win, as with cracking. Wasted votes mean that people are less likely to participate because they don't feel like their vote will make a difference. One final gerrymander strategy is called stacking, which links geographically distant areas to create a majority where one may not exist. This is where some of the very elongated congressional districts come in. But as we're gonna point out on the next slide, things are more complicated than just the shape of a district. For now though, let's use our visual to help us out. District one has been stacked, connecting a lot of blue that aren't geographically close to one another. 
District 2 has been packed. District 2 combines an overwhelming amount of red so that they will easily win this district, but aren't competitive in the other two. Finally, the reds in District 3 have been cracked so that they are nowhere near a majority. So in this abstract example, regardless of political parties, regardless of the candidates, regardless of voter turnout, regardless of the issue, the blues win two districts and the reds win one every time. This is why some people argue that gerrymandering discourages full democratic participation because election outcomes are determined before any votes are actually cast. Okay, so what? Why does this matter? What happens when electoral districts are gerrymandered? Well, gerrymandering can strengthen or weaken a particular party, depending on who is drawing the lines. And with the introduction of GIS and other computer software, an electoral cartographer could create a map where districts are highly competitive or districts that all but guarantee specific outcomes. So there's a lot of power for those who are drawing the electoral boundaries. Individual candidates are also impacted, particularly incumbents who are candidates who have already won election previously. When very elongated districts are drawn, representatives may live far away from some or many of their constituents. They may also come from different ethnic or economic backgrounds, and this can lead to detachment between the representative and the people they represent, their constituents. Voters may be less inclined to participate if they believe that their vote is wasted because the outcome has already been determined. And there have been a number of state and federal Supreme Court cases in recent years that challenge the quality or validity of electoral district lines. In fact, at the time of this recording in 2022, the current district lines in the state of Nevada were going through a legal challenge. Gerrymandering that gives a political party an advantage can violate the 14th Amendment to the Constitution that ensures equal participation in elections through the principle of one person, one vote. But not every gerrymander is illegal, even if it looks strange or elongated, even if it does give one group or political party an advantage. This is when things become especially tricky. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was established to address the effective denial of voting rights to minorities, called disenfranchisement. This law created what are called minority-majority districts. These districts are gerrymandered because they're drawn in such a way so that a particular ethnic minority constitutes a majority of the district's population and can elect a candidate of their choice. So these districts provide a greater voice to an ethnic minority by packing or stacking minority voters into a single legislative district. And courts have upheld these districts. So an odd shaped district, like the earmuff district in the Chicago area, or the goofy kicking Donald district in Pennsylvania, is not inherently an illegal gerrymander. The Earmuff District, which is actually the fourth congressional district for Illinois, was drawn to preserve the influence of Latino voters. The district looks like earmuffs because Latino voters live in two pockets or enclaves separated by a largely African-American community. The odd earmuff shape ensures that African-American voters don't dilute the influence of Latino voters and vice versa. There's actually a great quote about gerrymandering from a law school professor that I'll leave you with tonight. If you can explain why Goofy is kicking Donald Duck, and if that's a real 
community with real, profound, distinct representational interests. Maybe it doesn't matter that Goofy is kicking Donald Duck. And we will continue to examine these concepts when we return. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and I'll see you back in class.